uh, first of all, uh, thank Dr. Worley and all those that are responsible for this uh, opportunity to uh, be before you uh, this morning. Uh, though I do have to admit, uh, question exists. Uh, I could have talked about Sola Fide and you know Sola Scriptura and some of these other types. Somehow I got labeled with church and state, and I really can't figure out why. Uh, but hey, I'll do the best I can here. Um, I also have to admit that I'm just not prone to be uh, maybe as formal and, um, you know, smooth, because uh, this is an invitation for me to uh, share and share in the area of struggle, of asking questions, of knowing, for example, what the Word of God says, but then comparing with situations uh, in life, in society, and and how am I to then uh, think about these things? But I also appreciate the opportunity from another perspective. I, uh, in more recent years, have been uh, concerned about voice or voices of wisdom and consulting thinkers of the past, not to say that thinkers in the present don't have much to contribute on many areas, but there are reasons why some people have been read for over centuries. It's not to say that they were perfect. It's not to say that they addressed all issues that they may have needed to or that they have given all the right answers. But I do believe in God's providential grace, and God does provide, raise up people to address issues of the day, and if they are indeed in touch with the Word of God, in touch with His perspective, they have a way of lasting and contributing to those that would follow in, in years. So I wanted to bring some of the voices of the past to speak to the church in the present, and I realize that there's an immediate danger that enters in here from the standpoint of doing an injustice to their thought because each writer is addressing the issues of the day as best as they can in consultation with the Word of God as empowered by the Spirit, but they're addressing the issues of their day, so you run the risk of misrepresenting what they have to say, and so I, I do want to be uh, sensitive to that and also to the reality of the depth of thought of, of ancient writers and the like. But wisdom is concerned about the godly application of life, and thus I do believe that the church itself, with all the voices that make it up, have much to contribute to the day to enhance the possibility of things like wisdom and discernment, because although we are drawn to either ors, yes and no, wisdom invites scrutiny in the midst of. doesn't always give easy answers. Uh, we're sometimes called upon to trust God in ways that uh, previously we had not in order to deal with matters as they are presented before us. So I'm going to be presenting some specific guidelines from the thought of John Calvin in light of our um, reflections on the Reformation and his Institutes of the Christian Religion, particularly focusing on Book 4 and uh, Chapter 20, where he deals much with the realm of church and state. Um, my hope is to uh, deal with some of the particulars that he uh, voices here as points of reflection, for me, points of struggle. But in order to deal with the particulars that he brings forth there, I also want to try to place them in a larger, broader context. Here, as a beginning point, looking at a rather obscure North African church father, lived around 354 to about 4, his name will come to me um, sometime, uh, but he's noted for a number of works, but one of them being the city of God. And uh, I'll, I'll remember his name in a minute, uh, but uh, the framework uh, to present, to grapple with Calvin's particulars, seen against the backdrop of where our focus or where the foci of love are in the church. In Book 11, Section 28, 
The pull of a body's weight is, in a way, its love. Whether it tries to sink downward due to its heaviness or rise upward due to its lightness. For a body is drawn by its weight, just as a soul is drawn by its love, wherever it is drawn. From book 14, section 28, two loves then have made two cities. Love of self, even to the point of contempt of for God, made the earthly city. And love of God, even to the point of contempt for self, made the heavenly city. Thus the former glories in itself, and the latter glories in the Lord. The former seeks its glory from men, but the latter finds its highest glory in God, the witness of our conscience. The former lifts up its head in its, in its own glory. The latter says to God, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. In the former, the lust for domination dominates both its princes and the nations that it subjugates. In the latter, both leaders and followers serve one another in love. The leaders by their counsel, the followers by their obedience. The former loves its own strength, displayed in its men of power. The latter says to its God, I love you, O Lord, my strength. Members of the city, marked by the orientation of heart, first of all to God, to the things of God, and may I say to the people of God, show love by preaching the gospel and by being prophetic. Prophetic even to the state. Now, this message will not be an exegesis of the passages that were read, but as we encounter some of Calvin's thought, he is well within the parameters of these passages as he does some reflections on the nature of the church, the nature of the state, and the relationship between the two. Now, I was amazed to find as I was reading through this section that permeating all that was said was essentially a call to character. This is what I want to focus in on uh, as a, uh, a pervasive theme through the particulars here as well, that they that a, a focus on character that must begin with the people of God. This is a matter that is so foundational to those who love the Lord, love his ways, and love his people. Character in a word, what are we talking about here? I want to say in light of Calvin's uh, statements that we'll eventually get to here, it is the recognition and reverence of God that motivates one to actualize his perspective and his values in day-to-day -day life and all that this entails. This can even begin with someone like the uh, magistrate, but it would extend to a people group, for there is great concern, I think, for the character of a people who generate the lawgivers and the law enforcers. As he would say in book 4, chapter uh, 20, in section 9, for no one has discussed the office of magistrates, the making of laws, and the public welfare with beginning at, uh, uh, at, beginning at religion and divine worship. And thus all have confessed that no government can be happily established unless piety is the first concern. And that those laws are preposterous, I like saying preposterous, which neglect God's right and provide only for men. I want to summate Calvin's reflections, Calvin's particulars under three main themes, beginning with the reminder of what the church is. As we already know, because, I mean, we're Trinity, and we or in the Reformation, and we just take classes on this, so I'm sorry for repeating what you already know. But the dual components, the dual elements of the church, when Calvin would speak of the mark of the church, namely, he would say, the pure preaching of God's word and the lawful administration of the sacraments. 
Another helpful insight would come from Susan Schreiner writing in the uh, Oxford Encyclopedia of the Reformation. The church, according to Calvin, is a society of all the saints, a society which spread over the whole world and existing in all ages and bound together by the one doctrine and the one spirit of Christ, cultivates and observes the unity of faith and brotherly concord. In terms of the church, is it what, what it is, and what kind of emphases it should have, well, certainly the preaching of the gospel, certainly the instruction from the word, certainly the ministry of evangelism and these types of things. But what Calvin then goes on to point out is that what the church does not have, or what the church does not emphasize, is in a word, the sword. He says, for the church does not have the right of the sword to punish or compel, nor the authority to force, not imprisonment, nor the other punishments which the magistrate commonly afflicts. In short, the church is related to the functioning of the state, but it is not the state. Against the backdrop of some of the things that he shares, in light of the passages that were read, we can speak, secondly, of the role and attitude of the magistrate, the one in charge, the one who has certain responsibilities to uh, uh, in, uh, enforce laws and to uh, protect the innocents. As he would point out that the magistrate is the protector and guardian of the laws. It is, in his word, a lawful calling approved of God. In section three of this particular piece, he writes, in short, it provides, speaking of the magistrates, that a public manifestation of religion may exist among Christians and that humanity be maintained among men. Facilitation of the Christian faith and bringing about human uh, uh, the recognition of humanity of people commonly within that given society. For he does not mince words in speaking of the lust of wicked men. He would write that it cannot be restrained except by severity and the infliction of penalties. But then he goes on to say, in terms of balance, in terms of wisdom, because of the power and the, and the authority that is embodied in law enforcement or in the magistrate, he would say, Accordingly, no one ought to doubt that civil authority is a calling, not only holy and lawful before God, but also the most sacred and by far the most honorable of all callings in the whole life of mortal men. Now, I would have thought that the pastorate would have been, the, you know, the high calling. But it's those who are entrusted with power power over the lives of people in very determinative ways that constitutes a very high calling and a very high responsibility. But such a one is entrusted with the body of laws according to which the magistrate is to govern, and the people have the responsibility, and this would incorporate the church as well now, to be governed by the laws and obey the magistrate. Now, mind you, I hope that you understand it all, that I'm, I'm trying to make a presentation to do justice to uh, Calvin Sodden. and we're in this reformation mode. But if you think I'm not struggling with some of the things that are said here, I am. Can I say that? Is that okay? I mean, I'm, it's not formal. It's not smooth. It's, you know, it's just sharing. But that's where I am, you see. Calvin would also offer in light of the magistrate, an ideal of character, as he would say, to sum up, if they remember that they are vicars of God, they should watch with all care, earnestness, and diligence to represent in themselves two men some image of divine providence, protection, goodness, benevolence, and justice. 
they are exercising judgment, not for men, but for God. And here he would cite Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, using Moses as an example there. And I charge your judges at that time, hear the cases between your brothers and judge righteously between a man and his brother or the alien who is with him. You shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone, for the judgment is God's. And the case that is too hard for you, you shall bring to me, and I will hear it. Ideally, those and responsible for the enforcement of laws would recognize that they actually represent and they actually make decisions in light of God's perspective, and therefore are of extreme accountability. Can't talk about everything. Can't talk about everything that should legitimately be pointed out. But as a third element here, I want to talk about just some insights drawn from Calvin's reflections that speak of the response of the church. We are the church, and we have a recognition of what the nature of the magistrate or the governing body is. We are not the governing body. We function in relationship to, but there are certain responses that are appropriate against this backdrop. For one, we are continually called upon to recognize God's providence and respond in trust. This is what tests the nature of, the fiber of the church's true love, how we obey or not obey. There's much that is said in 1 Timothy 2 and Romans 13, but one of the common elements that exists between them is just the recognition that ultimately all authority resides with God. And he is capable of dealing with matters as he sees appropriate, and in the way that he sees appropriate. For you see, we as the members of the church are continually called upon to love God and to trust ultimately in him. And how is that manifested? Well, as much as possible in the realm of obedience. We are the ones who are to be to ex be the one, we are the ones who are going to be exercising rights, but manifested, tempered with a certain quality of character. We function within the system, but always with a particular orientation of character, because we have a particular orientation of love before God. Calvin would even give some insight into the realm of things like litigation, suing people for whatever is needed. But for the believer, the encouragement, the word is, but he should be far from passion or harm, or take revenge, far from harshness and hatred, far from burning desire for contention. You may have to be one who would exercise your right, your privilege to do such an activity, but you better be carrying it out with the right attitude with the right perspective, because you see you are properly oriented in love towards God, seeking to please him, which results in a particular manifestation or manifestations of character, you have to exercise certain rights, yes. But how you do them, with what attitude, is extremely important. Even Calvin himself would say, Augustine had, Augustine, that's the gentleman I was thinking of. <laughs> right, yeah, right here, he, he, he mentions him. Uh, Augustine had it right when he would then say, in light of Augustine's word, the righteous and godly man should be ready to patiently bear the malice of those whom he desires to become good in order to increase the number of good men. Not to add himself to the number of bad by a malice like theirs. If there's one thing uh, I kind of had to, you know, dwell upon in terms of, mm, how can I say it, matters of justice, and um, 
proper relationships and the like. I, the thing I continually worry about, not just for others, but for myself, that is that with the accumulation of power, how do I stop from becoming like my oppressor? That's where proper orientation of heart, development of character in light of God's principles provide a safeguard. And I recognize in myself as the older I get, I am every bit the oppressor as anybody else. What's the difference? The grace and goodness of God. And that is all. And let me now apply the acid test in terms of response. He does spend a great deal of time on, okay, uh, in so many words, what about bad or evil magistrates? What about them? Now, I want you to know that with some of the statements I want to I mention here, I'm not saying them. Calvin is. I probably wouldn't say these things, but you see, he would. So I'm just presenting what he says. Okay, but dealing extensively with the possibility of having evil, malicious rulers how do we in the church respond? I don't like what he says, but I got to wrestle with it. Can I do this? Can I, can I, can I talk like this? I, I know we're in chapel. And Section 31, book 4, chapter 20. For if the correction of unbridled despotism is the Lord's to avenge, let us not at once think that it is entrusted to us, to whom no command had been given except to obey and suffer. Now, I didn't say that. Calvin did. All right. He was probably having a bad day when he wrote that. He was obviously not in touch with reality or anything. But then, you know, nagging thought, just plain nagging as considers the evaluation of such rulers, let us first be mindful of our own misdeeds, which without doubt are chastised by such whips of the Lord, regarding the magistrate as a whip, this evil, malicious one as a whip for us. I don't like it, but that's what he says. But here I want to say that there is a uh, further discussion that he brings forth that definitely calls upon wisdom as forged within the realm of proper orientation of heart before God in love, the development of character in light of his guidelines, to be able to discern difference. For you see, he does do some discussion on the evil, malicious magistrate who calls commands to move against the ways and the will of God. And citing Acts 5.29 as an example. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. So you see the dilemma. You see the struggle. On the one hand, radical call for obedience because of trust in God and what God is able to do, the accountability manifests before God. But then at times, we're called to obey God rather than men. And I, for one, sisters and brothers, can't say I have an easy program on how to deal with matters case by case, issue by issue. It's an ongoing tension that I think can only be resolved in the conjunction of love for God, but then seeking him radically for wisdom. So to try to tie things together here uh, in terms of summary, Augustine leading us into an understanding of how pivotal love is, how pivotal love orientation is, because it is the mark of citizenship in the city of God, which then calls for a certain development of Christian character. And in so doing, I would suggest to you that we are then positioned better to hear his voice, to discern his will, when confronted with particular problems, with particular issues, when to yield, when to stand. 
that understanding is not always easily accessible except to the one who ultimately seeks to honor God in every way. But the elements of love's expression that should be evident continually of a citizenry built upon love of God should also then incorporate love of his way, his will. I don't always like what God has to say. But am I bound to it? Yes, by the power of the Holy Spirit. But you see, this love of God and the love of his way would also involve a love of his people because we now are in a position to exercise before the watching world godly living. And the Lord Jesus, I think, places in a very, very high uh, uh, priority when in his high priestly prayer of John 17, verses 25 to 26, he says, O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I have made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. Loving them, though, for who they are to God, and not necessarily how loving people because of how they fit into our pre-established understandings. Loving them for who they are in God. That's a whole other sermon. But with proper orientation, we better position to engage the issues related to the church and state with wisdom and discernment and with the blessing of God. Will you pray with me, please? Lord, who is able to adequately wrestle with all the issues that are presented before us, not only in terms of who we are, but what the state is, and then, Lord, how do we properly relate Grant us particulars, Lord, but particulars that arise from our growing love and fervency for you to fulfill your will and to be a community that truly models godly empowered love for one another. May we be found persuasive in these things. For we ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.